Well, turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. This was actually the passage that sort of started this little series that we're in, this underlined passages, underlined verses, kind of referring to that idea that we probably, many of us maybe have these passages that we love, and so we keep coming back. For me, you know, Isaiah 64, 4, if you've never read it, uh, mark that one down, go there later. It's just kind of my, one of my go-to passages, but probably you've got some of those too, where you just kind of keep coming back, and the Lord just kind of keeps speaking to you, caring for you, encouraging you, instructing you. Um, and then there's those other ones, those those perplexing ones, and you've probably got them just like I do, where you keep coming back because you, you're wrestling with, what does this mean? How do you... How do you put the pieces together of what this passage means about who God is and who I am and how I, how I relate to Him? And, and so I think over these few weeks we're kind of getting a, a glimpse of both. Some of these passages that are just the ones that just are a joy and encouragement, and other ones that are just a little bit perplexing. And I suspect that Matthew 17 fits in that latter category of what do we do with this story? A story of Jesus, a story of the disciples having failed in a miracle and Jesus having succeeded and, and a question that's going to be asked. And that's kind of our task this morning to work our way through it. Um, you can kind of make a note that this story actually occurs in in three Gospels. So it's going to be Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. All kind of add a little bit to the sort of the total picture, but all basically tell us the same series of events and all, interestingly enough, link the story that we're going to really consider this morning to another story, which is Jesus, what we would call the transfiguration of Jesus, the glory of Jesus revealed. This moment where Jesus took three of his disciples, they go up onto a mountain, and just for this brief moment, Peter, James, and John are allowed to see the glory of Jesus. Um, and I think it's by design. I, I don't think we should we should separate these two stories at all. In fact, I think they're linked because by the time we get to the end of this moment where Jesus is on the mountain and the disciples get to see his glory and, and the Father speaks and actually says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And then right afterwards, Jesus starts speaking about his death to these three men. And specifically about his resurrection. The reason I think it's all linked is because by the time we get to the end of chapter 17 by verse 22 and 23, Jesus comes back to speaking about his death. He's, he's not finished that conversation. But in between these two parts of the conversation comes a very peculiar scene. In fact, it's so peculiar that as I started kind of researching it over the last weeks, I thought... I wonder, I wonder what other people have done with this, commentators and preachers. And so I've gone and looked at, you know, people who have preached through this passage, and I've discovered a very interesting thing. You go through a series of sermons through Matthew, and you will discover that there's Matthew 16, and Matthew 17, the first part, and then there's Matthew 18. And you're going, what, what about this section? What happened to this this part of Matthew? Why, why didn't you? Do, and then you go to the commentaries and you read Matthew sixteen and the first part of Matthew seventeen, and then you read Matthew eighteen. And it's like there's this whole missing dark section over the last half of Matthew chapter seventeen. Now, by the time we're done, you might get why that is because we're kind of stepping into sort of a little bit perilous sort of territory here, dealing with issues like like healing and like faith and how these things fit and, and who God is in the middle of all this. But this is this is the passage where we get this bold, massive statement, you know, you have faith, nothing will be impossible for you. And there's been people who have just grabbed that statement and said, well, this is phenomenal. If, if that's what that means, then, then I'm just going to have faith that when I go home this afternoon, there's going to be a new car sitting in my driveway. Right? Isn't that how it works? And, and if I believe it enough, it'll be there. And, and, you know, and when I face hard things in life, if, if I just have enough faith that the hard things will just be wiped away, right? And I'll be, I'll be healed, I'll be wealthy, and everything will be good. And I've got some, some good news and some bad news. Let me deal with the bad news first. The bad news is that is not how it works. If it worked that way, then when we met Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, you know, Father, if it was possible, would you remove this cup? If that's the way it worked, then at that moment, that cup should have been removed. If, if that's the way it worked, when Paul prayed to God and said, God, would you remove whatever this thorn in my flesh is? And he did it three times. If that's the way it worked, then that should have been dealt with, but instead, 
God would say, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is I think there's some things in this passage that will build our faith, that will help us know who God is, that are absolutely spectacular. And so we're going to kind of dip our toe in for that reason. So here's how we're going to do it this morning. We're going to look at the story, sort of the plot line. We're going to walk through what, what is this story. Then we're going to look at, at the question that really kind of bubbles to the surface. Because by the end, there's a particular question that the disciples are going to come back to Jesus. Matthew talks about it and Mark talks about it. And I think this is the critical question that we need to wrestle through. Because it's going to lead us to two implications or applications, however you want to describe that. So that's kind of our plan. Get the story wrestle with this question, and then deal with a couple implications of what this all means. So, Matthew chapter 17, here's how the story unfolds, really, if we were to begin at about verse 14. Jesus and the disciples have, three of the disciples, have just come back, come down from the mountain. They've seen his glory, and while they were there, something's going on down in the valley. Now, now none of the accounts really talk about what's just been happening, but we can surmise pretty easily by, by the rest of the story what's been happening. A, a dad has brought his demon-possessed son to, G, to, to the disciples, the nine disciples, down in the valley who are left behind, and they come with a simple request, would you please cast this demon out of our, my son? And the disciples have tried, and the disciples have failed. That's the scene. And we pick up in the the record of this story in verse 14 in the chaos that's happening right after that. So when they came, this is Jesus and the three disciples, they're the they, when they came to the crowd... A man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. By the way, there's going to be at least two words in this passage that the English, the way we put them in English, I think is so unfortunate. Because epilepsy is a, is a medical issue, right? And what we're dealing with here is a demon-possessed boy. And there's, there's now this sort of weird mingling of two things that weren't mingled. The word actually is, it's a strange word, I'll explain it just for a brief moment. It's the moonstruck. This, this boy is moonstruck. There was this view that somehow this demonic stuff was interwoven with the, the moon and how it moved and somehow um, it, it came to the point that this word moonstruck would describe what they're seeing. We actually have a word for it and I don't mean it in any sort of derogatory sense, but just so you understand the same word today, lunatic. Right? Hopefully we don't use that word of anyone. But you've probably heard the word. Do you think of the first part of that? Luna? The moon. Right? It's the carryover of this idea that somehow all these things are kind of woven together. But what we've got here is a boy who is demon-possessed and a dad who's desperate for his healing. Now, if we were to go to, to Mark and Luke, we would see that there's a little bit more going on in the story. We would see that... There had been this, this argument between the disciples and some scribes who are part of this crowd. So, so we get a sense of who this crowd is that Matthew just told us about. This crowd that Jesus and the disciples have come to is made up of at least the father and this boy, the nine disciples, some scribes who are like the legal experts in the, in the day of Jesus, and some onlookers. There's our crowd. And they've been watching this whole scene unfold. And there's an argument that's begun that we don't really know the nature of the argument. We can guess, maybe. If I was a disciple and I failed, and now the scribes are saying, hey, explain this to us, you can probably start to put together what this conversation looked like. And into the middle of all that, Jesus comes on the scene and says, what's going on? Now, you get that when you take all three of those, the, the Matthew, the Mark, and the Luke version, put them together, that's our scene. What's going on? I mean, it's interesting that no one in this whole crowd wants to speak up. I mean, I understand why the scribes don't want to speak up, because they've gone head-to-head with Jesus, and they've lost every time. I think they're getting, they've learned their lesson. So every time we try to, try to respond to Jesus or catch him, we end up losing this. I get why the disciples maybe didn't want to speak up. They've just failed miserably. I, I think in their minds, maybe they wished that this whole crowd could have just dispersed before Jesus got back. No one would have been the wiser. Jesus wouldn't have understood their failing, and we could just pretend like this never happened. It's interesting, though, that no one in the crowd speaks up. The onlookers. So I, if I was an onlooker, I would have thought I would have been quite happy to point out, hey, Jesus, let me explain what's happened here. 
you know, this is pretty weird. Your disciples try. But the onlookers don't. The, the man who speaks up is actually the father. He comes forward, he drops to his knees, he calls Jesus his Lord, and then he begins to describe what's happened. I've got a boy, and he is, as Luke says, shattered. Isn't that quite the word? And my son is, is just shattered. He's broken. There's a demon that has possessed him, and his life is just shattered. And, and it's interesting, I think it, I'm not sure if it's Luke or Mark that points it out, that the father actually uses these words, he's my only begotten son. I, I, don't, I don't tend to discard those kind of statements because we know that Jesus is the only begotten son of the Father. And now you've gotten Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, speaking to a dad who says, I've got one son, and he's broken. And I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't help. There's our scene. You kind of start picturing maybe a little bit in your mind a man in the dust and the dirt, probably tears coming down his face. There's this boy who's out of control, who is broken, presumably scarred and marred and burned and and all the other descriptions that come through the story. And this man came to the disciples as the final hope. These were the men that maybe could somehow bring an answer, a relief, a solution, deliverance. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Now it's an interesting kind of debate over who's Jesus speaking about. Some people talk about the scribes or the disciples. I think probably the way it sounds, it's just like he just looks at this whole scene. this, This whole thing is just twisted and broken. That's what the word perverted means. It's just twisted. It's just a broken world. And you sense the frustration, don't you? How long do I have to just put up with being in this brokenness, having come from glory, having just been on the mount? I mean, that's the, that's the shadow of this, isn't it? Having just heard his father speak, having just had his glory revealed, how much longer do I have to live down in the valley with this kind of brokenness? Now, there's another conversation that is going to be recorded. I think Mark records it for us that I think is, is pretty important to kind of jump to. And if you've got your Bible, it actually wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to kind of have a finger in Mark 9 and, and then one here in Matthew chapter 17. Because Mark's going to add a, a second little part of the conversation that Jesus has with, with this father that, that Matthew doesn't tell us about. Uh, so picking up in Mark chapter 9, um, Verse, uh, let me see, what do we pick up in verse 20? They brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. He fell on the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Again, it's one of those strange little moments in the story where you think, it's an irrelevant detail. It's going to make no difference to what... Jesus is going to do. His healing isn't different because it's been there a long time or a short time. It doesn't affect anything in our story other than this, I think. It's, it's a point where this dad is going to learn that the man who's about to heal him is actually interested in him. It's the only thing I can see in that, that Jesus is going to say, you know what, dad... This isn't about just coming to access a power that I somehow have. This is about coming into a relationship with a person of who I am. And so I'm interested in you. Can you tell me a bit of the story? Now, whether Mark records the full answer or not, we don't really know. But we get this much. It's been happening since he was young. It's just kind of been there all along. Now, that's, that's kind of an interesting detail for for 
well, one reason. And the other one that's kind of interesting is that we find out this boy's mute. So basically what we find out in this little conversation is that, that this situation is about as hard as they get. So let me kind of explain why that is. The Jews had this belief. It, it's not a biblical belief, but here is their belief. You couldn't cast a demon out unless you knew its name. Right, so once you knew the name of the demon, this is not biblical, everyone getting this? It's not in the Bible. As soon as you knew the name of the demon, then you could have authority over it. Right? So it's pretty important to be able to speak to the person and say, tell me the name of whatever this demon is, and then the demon would speak, and then you'd have authority over it. That was just kind of their sort of strange, strange view. Not biblical, but that's what they believe. Now you can imagine the dilemma that comes when this boy is mute. See the problem? In the Jewish world, it's like, well, this is impossible. You can't find out the name, so we're just stuck. We got nothing left. That was, that was kind of the one bullet we had to fire. Learn the name of the demon, then we can do something. But seeming say, you can't talk. We, we don't have anything to do. The, the compounding thing, too, is the duration of this. Again, you see this in the healings of Jesus. They had this sort of view, again, that the longer something went on, the harder it was, which kind of makes sense, right? So if you were just newly sick and came to Jesus and he healed you, it was like, well... That's, I, I guess that's somewhat impressive. But when you get these other stories of a woman who's been ill for years, right, and their minds are going, oh, okay, this one's different. When you get someone who's been blind, say, for example, since birth in John 9, this one is earth shattering. And when you get a boy who's not just recently demon-possessed, you get a boy who's now been like this since he was a wee little boy who can't speak. What we've now learned is that this is kind of an impossible situation. Whatever happens next, we should have at least had a little bit of sympathy for the disciples. Surely, probably some of the crowd would have. They would have looked and said, well, you know, this one's hard. This is about as hard as it gets. So let's give them kind of some slack here because had it just been a run-of-the-mill demon that was just sort of newly on the scene and the person could speak and we could get his name, probably they would have been able to handle this one. But, but this is a totally different situation. And Jesus has this conversation. And the man says to Jesus, okay, back into Mark here for a second. He says this, if you can do anything, have compassion on us, help us. Presumably he came to Jesus in the first place, came to the disciples in the first place because he had a fair degree of confidence that they could do something. I mean, surely the stories of what Jesus has done have circulated. Even the stories of what the disciples have done most likely have circulated because before Matthew 17 comes Matthew 10 where Jesus had actually instructed his disciples to go and they are to, to heal and to preach and to cast out demons. They've gone out, they've come back, they are so excited because it worked. These guys are seasoned now. They, they've been doing this. This isn't something new to them. They've got experience. They've got a resume that says, on my resume, cast out demons, check. Heal the sick, check. Preach the kingdom, check. We've been doing this. People knew. And now the man comes to Jesus and says, if, if you can do anything, would you help? You just that one last word before we carry into Jesus' response, help. It, it means, would you run quickly to my aid? That's an interesting picture, right? Where someone's kind of in need and you're saying, he's like, please just come quickly. I think it's worth doing the extra little bit of effort to just kind of making sure we kind of just feel a little bit of what this dad would have felt. Absolute Desperation. Right? And if you're a parent, and some of you are, and some of you aren't, this isn't a mysterious thing. Oh man, if your kid needed help, you would do anything in your power. And this man has nothing left other than his hope in Jesus. And Jesus, if you can do anything, would you please run to our aid quickly? But look at Jesus' response. If you can. Now that's a, an interesting little little thing. Because um, it can mean one of two things, right? And maybe it means a little bit of both. It, it could just be that Jesus is kind of responding back, saying, are you seriously asking me if I can do anything? Like, if, 
If you can do anything, come to our mercy. If you can. Or it could be taken in another sense where Jesus is saying to this man, the question isn't about whether I can. The question actually rests a little bit in your category here too. If, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Basically turning this back on his dad and saying, you know what, the, the issue's never going to be with me. But I'm now asking you a question about your faith. Hey, where are you at with your faith? Where are you at with your belief? And, and it could be, like I said, kind of going a little bit both directions where we've got a, a strange little play going on on this statement, this, this, this idea that this man brings up about the, the possibility but the uncertainty of what's going on here that Jesus is turning it back on him. Immediately the father cried out and said, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Same word, by the way. Remember, if you can help me, if you can help my son, would you run quickly to his aid? He, pull, he pulls the same word out and he says, Jesus, I believe. But if you can help me, could you run quickly to aid my unbelief? Because here I am, a dad that's at my wit's end. I got nothing left. And there's a part of me that's here because I do believe. And then there's a part of me that's been through every treatment, every every approach. We've visited every doctor, every priest, we were just with your disciples and no one's been able to do it. I need your help with my unbelief because this is a mixed bag. I do and I don't. And I need your help. Would you rush quickly to my aid? And some of you might only get this this morning because you're kind of sitting in one of those, one of those moments where you're going, I, I do believe, but man, this has been going on for a long time. And I've cried out to God. God, I need you to help me with my unbelief because this is a mixed bag. What's going on in here? Jesus, I believe. Would you help me this morning with the unbelief that's inside of me? Would you run quickly to my aid? Jesus sees the crowd come. Presumably, at this point, Jesus is not really doing many more public miracles. We can kind of see that in the, in the bigger plot line of the Gospels. His public ministry is winding up, and so it seems like as the crowd starts pressing in, Jesus decides, I'm going to bring this whole thing to a close before it attracts too much attention. And, and I love the simplicity, and this is always the simplicity when Jesus heals or delivers. Here it is, verse 24. The Father cries out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd come running, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him, never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he's dead, but Jesus took his hand and lifted him up, and he arose. That's that's Mark's extended account. If you go to Matthew's account, it's it's even shorter than that. He, He just basically heals him. And he's better. And I love Luke's version of it because he, he adds one other really interesting detail. The crowd who watches this are astonished and they marvel at God. I think that's the right response. They get it right. Whatever else they understand is going on here, they understand that God has just shown up. And they marvel rightly at God. Okay, so that's the plot line. There's just kind of one, one last little scene that comes right at the end. So after, after all this is done, dad and his son go home. They're probably happy. The crowd disperses. The scribes go away mumbling. The disciples are there. And, and we get one last little part. Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. It comes right near the end of, of Mark chapter 9. The disciples asked him, or sorry, um, where are we here? I'm in the wrong little part here. Um, i got to turn my page here. The disciples asked him, in verse 19 of Matthew 17, privately, why could we not cast it out? Mark actually adds this little detail. He says, later, when they're in the home, they ask him privately, and then the same question. When you're reading in Mark, this is just a little bonus thing, if you're ever doing devotions in Mark, pay attention to when they go into a house. 
that's kind of like Mark's little way of telling you whatever's about to happen, whatever the conversation that's about to happen is really important. It seems like the disciples and Jesus have all these critical little discussions later when they go into the house. They ask their questions, Jesus gives the answers later when they go into the house. And, and, and now we come to a Mark 9 moment where later they go into the house and they ask Jesus. We don't understand what just happened there. I mean, we understand, we, we know what happened. We failed, you came along, you healed the boy. But here's our question, why couldn't we do it? So there's the plot, and here's, here's our critical question. Why couldn't we do what we'd always been doing? Every once in a while when I'm building, because I, I love building, I, I love renovating. You come into my house, you probably right now trip over two-by-fours at the entrance and that kind of stuff. And I've worked with new materials and old materials, and sometimes you get a pile of stuff, and, and say you're framing a wall, and some of the two-by-fours are, are nice and soft, and as you're just sort of nailing some spikes in, they just drive in nice and straight and true and easy. And then you pick up the next one, and you didn't realize you just grabbed an old, hard two-by-four. Not like the new ones you're going to get at Home Depot. These are like the real deal. They got meat to them. And, and you didn't realize you did it, but you're driving the spike, and all of a sudden you drive it, and you realize, oh, that didn't, it barely barely made a dent. Maybe your nail, because they're so soft and cheap now, maybe your nail bends, and it just kind of catches you off guard. And it catches you off guard because you've done this a a hundred times before. So many times, in fact, that you weren't even really thinking about it, because it's just sort of second nature. Bang, 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 and then all of a sudden, the next time, it's like, whoa, what just happened? And you have to stop and kind of catch yourself, and you look down, and you go, oh, I see. This, This was one of these old boards it's kind of got nice and hard and seasoned, and it was probably a different kind of wood. Maybe it was fir, not this, you know, spruce or pine kind of a thing. And it, but you didn't see it coming. And that's kind of what's going on here. The disciples, they've been down this road before. They've healed. They've cast out demons. They've done this routine. And when this man comes, I don't think the problem is that they weren't sure whether they were going to be able to cast this demon out. You see, I think that's, that's kind of what we read into it. We read into it this group of men, and we're going to see the answer that Jesus gives in just a second, who come along, try to do this, but didn't have enough faith. And they just believed they could do it. It would have worked. Uh, Throw that out completely, because that's not what's going on here. These men came along, had every expectation they were going to be able to do this, because they'd been doing it all along. And then they banged the nail and went, whoa, let's hit it harder. And they did it again. And it's like, still didn't work. And now, genuinely perplexed, they come to Jesus with a question. Why couldn't we do this? Now, Matthew and Mark give Christ's response to this question. In Matthew, Jesus says, because of your little faith. Mark gets at the same issue, but the, 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 the part of the answer that Mark records, and I suspect it was a, a longer answer, and we just get two little pieces of it being recorded. Mark's recorded answer is, this kind only comes out by prayer. Now again, this kind, it's, another, it's the second English thing in here that gets us confused. Because if I read that in a natural sense, it sounds like Jesus is saying, there's like, well guys, there's 18 kinds of demons. There's the easy ones. That's the kind you were doing back in Matthew 10. But this kind, whew, you've never met this kind. This is the hard kind, guys. And I hadn't given you, you know, enough authority. I didn't give you the instruction. This kind, you got to do a little. That's not what it means at all. The, the word is just like, Species. In, in other words, what he's saying is, guys, to do this, to have authority over the evil one, to cast out a demon, requires prayer. It doesn't matter what kind. It doesn't matter what demon. It doesn't matter how many. It's not like there's eight kinds and there's a scale of hardness or power or strength. Just, guys, this sort of thing... It only happens through prayer. Now, those two answers have some real similarities, don't they? Both kind of reflect on this issue of of faith and dependence on God. On the one hand, Jesus' answer kind of points to the fact that, you know what, unless you go before 
our Heavenly Father and, and call out to Him and recognize that it's not your ability, it's His that's going to do this, and you pray, nothing's going to happen. And the other answer, He just gets more right to the heart of it. It's a faith-related thing, and it's not about the size of your faith, it's about the one you have faith in. And you start to see that both answers kind of get to the same issue. It it appears that the disciples had gone through this so many times. They had preached so many sermons that the time that they got up that Sunday and they got up and preached and forgot that they needed God. And then they tried to preach and they fell flat on their face. They just kind of lost sight that this was not their skill. They led worship and they'd been up here doing this for the last five years. And then they just kind of forgot that this is only possible when God works. And so they got up with all their skill and they got up with their instrument and their voice and they did their thing and they went through the motions and then they said, whoa, something was not right. Or they taught a Sunday school class and they sat down with the kids and for years they had done the same thing. They taught the same class. They taught the same lesson. They're in you know, year three of the three-year rotation and they're through the third time through the lap and they know the lesson like the back of their hand and they're just going through the, the routine with the kids and then Sunday afternoon they step back and go, why is it? It seems like not one of those kids was impacted with the gospel. Or they've led people to the Lord and they've done it and they know the gospel presentation. They know the four spiritual laws. They know Romans wrote back of their hand and they go to their neighbor and they do the most brilliant thing and the neighbor just kind of shrugs and walks away. like Because they forgot that it's not about just knowing the four spiritual laws. Knowing a nice little routine to walk through. They forgot that that only happens because God shows up. This only happens when God shows up. This only happens through the mercy and grace of God. Downstairs only happens, not because of the skill of our teachers, because God gives sight to little kids and ears that can hear his word. And here we meet nine disciples who forgot. This only happens when God shows up. And so you had better pray and you had better have faith in God because if it's just your effort and your skill, oh man, we're in trouble. Now, I want to point out something that I think Matthew does to help us in this. I, Matthew's already used this little phrase um, that he picks up here in chapter 17, oh you of little faith. He's used it kind of all throughout his book. And, and, and each time he uses it, there's something that's going to happen that, that is shared in common in all of the scenes. So I just want to make sure we, we see this here for just a moment. If we were to go back into, I think chapter 6 is the first time it shows up, where Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and he's teaching about the provision of God, and, and uh, it's quite a, a powerful scene there as he's teaching you know, the crowds, but definitely teaching his disciples. And he starts talking to them in chapter 6, verse 30, and here's what he says. If God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and gone tomorrow and cast into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? He he pinpoints something. He said, guys, here's going to be the problem. The problem's going to come not when you've got a closet full of clothes and you look and you say to yourself, oh Lord, I trust that you will clothe me. Because we might do that. I I mean, I didn't wake up this morning going, you know what, Lord, I am totally dependent on you to clothe me. Because I had a closet full of clothes. The problem comes when it's empty. There's nothing. That's what Jesus is getting at. Fast forward to chapter 8. Now they're on the Sea of Galilee. And they're in a boat, and Jesus is sleeping, and a storm comes up. And they wake Jesus up. Because they're convinced they're all going to die. And Jesus says to them, why do you fear? Oh, you have little faith. I think if we'd gone back to the beach on a sunny day and we'd said to the disciples, guys, do you trust that Jesus could save you if your life was at stake? I think the answer would have been, absolutely. Here on the beach in the sunshine, yeah, Jesus, 
we believe it. Put them in a boat in the middle of the night with waves crashing over the edge. All of a sudden, we're not quite sure. sure. Fast forward a few more chapters. Matthew chapter 14. Peter gets out of a boat. I mean, this one's spectacular. He trusts Jesus enough to actually climb out of a boat and start to walk on water. Until we're told one thing happens. He takes his eyes off Jesus and he sees the waves. I mean, we don't even have to speculate, Peter, would you trust Jesus enough to get out of the boat? The answer is, he did. The problem came when he took his eyes off Jesus and started to see the waves. And again, Jesus' response to him is, Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? One, one last scene in chapter 16 of Matthew. The disciples have crossed over the galley with Jesus and they forgot to bring bread. They got no food. And this isn't like the, the multiplying and feeding the, the thousands moment. This is just them with Jesus. And again, his response is, O oh, you of what kind of faith? Little faith. You, you don't want to know what little, little faith is? Little faith is what you've got when you've got bread in your pocket. Little faith is what you've got when you're safe on the beach. Little faith is what you've got when there's a closet full of clothes and you don't need Jesus to clothe you. Little faith is what the disciples had in Matthew chapter 17 when they had been through this before. I mean, they had a degree of faith, but Jesus says it's, that's what little faith is. It's a little faith that you've got something so you're not totally dependent on me. Big faith is when the fridge is empty. You say, Lord, I believe you're going to provide. Big faith is what you've got when the bank account is drained. You say, Lord, I'm still going to trust you. Big faith is what you've got when you're lying on, you know, I don't know what they call them, those gurneys about to go into the operating room. And you've got no ability to control anything. And you say, Lord, I'm, st- I'm going to trust you. Big faith is what Jesus wanted for his disciples, knowing that there'd be a time when he would go to his father and he was going to leave these men. And he wasn't going to be with them on the beach, with them in the streets. He was going to need them to trust him and be completely dependent on the father. Now, I have not answered all the questions of this response. There's all sorts of interesting little side things we could go. I want to just deal quickly with a couple implications before we wrap up. Here we go. First is this. This is an incredibly powerful lesson in faith. And here's the, here's the sad part. Because this, this whole scene has kind of been hijacked by, by sort of what we might call like the, the, the faith sort of if you watch a TV preacher who says, you know, like you can be rich and never get sick again, kind of an idea, chances are they'll go to a passage like this. Like if you just had faith, Jesus says it right there. Oh, you have little faith. But if you had faith the size of this mustard seed that I'll send you, if you send me in $10, right, we, we know the kind, then you can have or do or be anything you want. Forgetting totally that that it's the will of God who directs our steps. And that, that's the important part. I mean, you can do anything. I mean, that's, that's the, the point of it. With God, there's nothing that's impossible. And you can do anything that is in line with what God asks you according to his will. If God asks you to go to China and be a missionary, you might sit there and go, but Lord, I can't do this. But if God's asking, he will help you. If God says, go talk to your neighbor about Jesus... And you go, but, but God, I can't do that. I can barely string a sentence together. I'll be so nervous, it'll be a disaster. God says, if, if that's my will, you can do that. It's not a carte blanche just to say, you can just make up whatever you want, and God is somehow bound to do that. That's not the point of the passage. But you see how this one gets hijacked. Now here's the, here's the danger. Because it gets hijacked, those of us sort of on the other side of this going, oh man, every time this comes up, I start getting a little bit queasy because I see the abuses of this. We, we do the, the pendulum swing the other way and we go, oh man, anytime people start talking about faith, let's, 
Let's kind of downplay that. But you go back and you read these stories all throughout Scripture. You know Daniel, when he goes into the lion's den? You want to know what Daniel 6 tells us? The reason he's delivered from the lion's mouth? Well, no, it's in black and white. It's right there in the story. It's because he believed. Obviously, it was God that did it, but faith mattered. It really mattered. Faith matters. And I just want to say that to us as a church family. How God works all that out in his sovereignty, I'll never be able to explain. But that it matters, we just need to drive a, a stake in and say, you know what? Despite the fact that there's all these abuses and twists and perversions of this that make God into something he's not, faith still matters. Never let the pendulum swing so far that we just sort of go, you know what? It can't matter because it, it's just been too twisted. Faith, faith matters. That's the first thing. In fact, Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's, true. that's just who we are. And we need to be a people of, of growing faith. In fact, that's his prayer request for the Thessalonians. That's what he praises God over. He starts with that. I am just so thankful to God that your faith is growing abundantly. That's what he wants. Now, how does that happen? Here's the application side of this. We read God's word. Because I see only one spot aside from praying and asking God like this man, Lord, I believe but help my unbelief. I only see one other place in scripture that actually tells me how to grow my faith. And that's Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's why it's so important when we talk about, you know, quiet time and doing devotions. It's not just that we're saying, hey, you know what, if you tick that box every morning, Jesus is going to love you. What we're actually saying is you want to know what? If you want to be able to grow in your faith and and trust the Lord more, this is it. We've got one thing, and Jesus has told us what it is. Let's do it, that our faith would abound. Second application is to ministry. In fact, I think as I've spent lots of time this week in Matthew 17, I think the lesson is more about how we do ministry than it is about healing. Again, I think we get sort of confused when we read this as just a a healing or demon delivering story and miss the fact that this is actually a a story about how things get done. See, behind all the the English, there's this word that keeps popping up, this Greek word. Those of us, you know, those who are doing the the Greek 101 on Sunday night, so you you could take this passage and dig in a little bit. The word is dunamis, it's power. It, It just keeps popping up all through the story. Are you able? Can you do this? This is the same word. It just keeps coming up and up and up. How are we able to do things? That's the critical question. Even the question that that the disciples come and they ask, why could? That's the word. Hey, Jesus, where does the ability to do this stuff come from? That's really what they're asking Jesus. And his answer to them is, God. It's not you. It's never going to be your skill. You're never going to be good enough at casting out demons to go this on your own. And in a church like ours, because we talk often about how much we feel the Lord has blessed us and provided for us, you want to know what? It's a great building. And you'll hear if you come to our AGM that God has blessed us with finances. And we welcome two new staff and we sit back and we go, oh, this is so good. You know what? You take God out of that, we've got nothing. In fact, Jesus put it this way, and I'll end here, when he talked to his disciples in John 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So let's do something. We don't want to be a people whose lives amounted to nothing. We want to be a people whose lives counted for something. And to do that, let's remain in Christ. Would you pray with me, Father? We thank you for your word. Thank you that you make it plain of who you are and how we can walk with you. And Father, even at the expense of your disciples being embarrassed and criticized and going through a what must have been a gut-wrenching difficult moment for them, we're thankful that we can learn from it. That we need to remain in you. We need to be dependent on you. It's never about our skill. It will never be about the resources we bring to bear. It's always about you. And so, Father, as we have flourished as a church, as we've been blessed, and as we've seen so much provided for us, help us never get confused on what counts most, that we would remain in you and through you do much in this community for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.